So hi folks, we're just getting set up. We'll be starting in just a couple minutes. Hi folks, we're just getting set up. We'll be starting in just a couple minutes. It's funny, every now and then you see this little thing, this little box pop up and it's because Zoom hides most of its controls except for one or two. And for some reason when it does this little one particular pop up, sometimes it blocks the screen and then it complains. <laughs> so, like now. So, you know, um, maybe we should turn the waiting room off just for this beginning part and then turn it on again because otherwise it's going to keep on blocking my screen. Done. Thank you. Well, we're at seven o'clock, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Vivian New, the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I want to welcome everybody to our program meeting tonight. Um, we're featuring Justin Whittle, who's going to be talking about juggling jewel flowers. Uh, but we have a few things to touch on before that. Uh, we have a number of programs coming up in July and even more in the works. So uh, please stay tuned because there's a lot of fun things going on with our chapter. Uh, we have a, a pretty active photography group. So if you're into photography, you just like to share pictures or if you just like to look at pretty pictures, um, you can join our photography group. And they have a weekly photo sharing thing that goes on with the email group. And then a once a month photo sharing meeting on Zoom. And the next one's on July 8th. Uh, next month, we have another program meeting, uh, which will be a Death Valley travel log with Matt Berger. And that's on July, uh, oh, that's in July and, uh, sorry, uh, that's in July. And then we also have another live going native garden tour garden visit and chat on July 22nd. So please uh, join us. We've got a lot of fun stuff happening. And to find out what's happening, you can get it an email once a week with the latest things going on by joining our chapter news list, which is at cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at Google Groups. And that's a very long thing, um, string, but you can just go to our website, cnps-scv.org, and there's information on how to join there. And if you are gardening and looking for native plants, uh, we haven't been able to have people come to our nursery for our usual monthly member sales, but we do have online sales with delivery from Belmont to San Jose now. So if you are in need of native plants, um, you can shop online and we'll bring the plants to you. 
And if you are enjoying these talks and you're interested in helping out, we can use help. Uh, we're looking for people to help with moderate, moderating our questions during the talks, um, acting as a co-host, and doing some video editing cl cleanup of these talks after they move on to YouTube. So if any of those things are of interest to you, please get in touch with us. Um, we have, uh, I've listed contact information here, but it's also available on our website. So we would love to have more people join our volunteer team. And just a little bit of logistics about how we manage the, these talks. We have a lot of people on, and so we can't really have people jumping in and asking questions. But if you do have questions, just type them into the chat. We have people watching the chat and at um, various points during the talks, uh, they will read the questions from the chat uh, to the presenters so you can get your answers then. And today we're gonna be starting with one of um, the winners of one of our scholarships, the Sally Casing Shooting Stars Graduate Research Scholarship, uh, Sarah Gaffney, she's from UC Davis. And she researches plant soil feedback to understand their role in California grassland invasions. And currently she's studying the role of soil health in native grassland restoration. Um, specifically, she's looking at how goat grass and medusa head change the nutrient balance in uh, those grasslands and the microbial community and soil moisture. Uh, we're ho she's hoping that research on this topic will help with grassland restoration and help to bring back our California native grasslands. So Sarah, please go ahead and, and take, um, take control. Okay, thank you. So hello everybody and thank you for having me tonight. I've been looking forward to telling you all about the research that your grant has made possible for me. Uh, so tonight I'll be talking about plant soil feedbacks and their role in California grassland invasions and restoration. And I don't have results ready yet to present to you. So instead I'm just going to focus on the concept as well as my experimental approach. Hold on a second. So as I'm sure you are all aware, California grasslands are highly invaded. They have been dominated by exotic annual grasses for the last 250 to 300 years, uh, such as species such as Avena and Bromus, but more recently the destructive noxious annual species of goat grass, which is Agelops triancialis, and Medusa head, which is Elemis triant, sorry, Elemis caput medusae. And so native grassland restoration is taking place across the state to increase biodiversity, na native pollinator and wildlife habitat, as well as ecosystem services, such as carbon storage. And unfortunately, many projects fail. And sometimes this is due to it being a bad precipitation year, you know, when there's a a drought year, there's just not enough rain for the natives to really establish. But other times, the reason is rather unknown, is unknown and it's attributed to it just being a bad year or a tricky site. And this is further exacerbated by limited post-restoration monitoring due to lack of funds. But another reason could be that we're not considering the soil enough. And so the main question that's guide, guiding my research is, is the soil hindering native restoration success? And I'm hoping to shed more light on this question by exploring the concept of plant soil feedbacks. Plant soil feedbacks occur when a plant species alters some soil property, be it biological, physical, or chemical, in such a way that that change then influences the trajectory of the plant community. And plant, plant soil feedbacks can occur on multiple scales, both temporally and spatially. And an example of a positive feedback across geological time is soil organic matter. So the more plants that are growing, the more organic carbon that accumulates, which in turn creates a better environment for plant growth, meaning that more plants are going to be able to grow there, which leads to further accumulation of organic matter, unless that positive feedback continues. 
However, planned cell feedbacks also occur in much more local scales, and that's what my research focuses on. And I'm specifically interested in whether plant soil feedbacks are related to invasion here in, I'm sorry, are you guys seeing, you, you guys are seeing my screen, right? Okay, yes, sorry, the, the green bar went away, so I was just concerned. Okay, yeah, so I'm interested in whether plant soil feedbacks are related to invasion here in our grasslands. And the general idea is that we have our invasive species enter the ecosystem and it starts to alter the soil. And then the native plants no longer perform well in that altered soil. And so they start to decrease in number and are less competitive to that invasive species. And that results in opening up of more space and resources for that invasive species. So that invader benefits and increases in population size. And then the cycle continues leading to dominance of that invasive species. And we know that the exotic grasses here in California grasslands do change the soil in some ways. They're known to affect nitrogen cycling change the composition of the microbial community, and due to their shorter root system, they reduce deep soil organic matter. And these are all characteristics of plant soil feedbacks that have led to invasion in other systems. And our native grasses are thought to be sensitive to these changes, but we really need experiments to determine if and how these changes to the soil actually are affecting native plant performance. And this leads me to my two objectives. One, are exotic annual and native perennial grasses altering soil properties? And two, are these changes resulting in a plant soil feedback that negatively impacts the other's establishment and performance? And this is important because knowing what soil properties have actually changed and the extent to which natives are impacted by invasive grass plant soil feedbacks is essential for a successful native restoration. Because if soil is no longer conducive to native growth, then the current practice of just removing invasive species before planting the natives will, will not be enough. And restoration practi practitioners may have to first ameliorate the soil before we can get those natives to flourish. So moving on to my methods, one of the reasons that I'm really excited about my research is because of the experimental approach. And the traditional plant soil feedback experiment has two phases, the conditioning phase and the feedback phase. The conditioning phase is when you put the first generation of plants in the soil and as it grows, it conditions or alters some soil properties. So then you remove that vegetation and enter the feedback phase, which is when you plant either the same species or another species in that conditioned soil. And you measure its growth to see whether or not it grows better in soil conditioned by itself or by the other species. And most of the plant soil feedback experiments that are out there have been occurring in the greenhouse using pots and mostly one or two species in total. And this is really great in that it proves a direct causal link between the conditioning and that feedback. However, there are some downfalls to these greenhouse experiments in that they have been shown to be over-exaggerating the strength of this feedback between species. And so there have been calls to perform more plant soil feedback experiments completely out in the field in a more realistic setting where variables like competition and weather patterns have influence. And my experiment is one of the first to take, in, to take place entirely out in the field with both of those phases. And so I'm using plots that are from a larger grassland experiment uh, set up by my advisor, Dr. Valerie Evener here at UC Davis. That, and these plots were either conditioned by either native grasses or exotic grasses for 10 years. And that's also notable because a lot of these feedback experiments are really only one to two years in total. Um, so we're hoping that after 10 years, we're going to see big differences between these soils that have been dominated by native species for so long or by exotic species. And when I'm referring to the natives, I'm referring specifically to Stipopulcra and Elemis triticoides and Glaucus, because th those were the three main grasses that we seeded in these experiments. 
And then for the exotic condition plots, we wanted them to be mostly Medusa head and goat grass, but just because we don't, um, we have not been managing these plots really over these years, we chose plots that were at least 50% cover of Medusa head and goat grass for those 10 years. And that remaining 50% of cover is largely Avena fatua and Bromus hordiaceus. So for phase one, the main question that I have is how are these two condition soils differing? So we can only ameliorate negative effects of exotic grasses if we know what property of the soil is being affected. So we can't take action if we don't know what is happening. So I took soil cores at four different depths up to 90 centimeters. And that's important because the natives produce much deeper roots than the exotics. And so we expect to see strong differences across that depth gradient. And so with that soil, I'm measuring several soil properties that are known to influence plant performance. So I'm measuring gravimetric soil moisture, which is the amount of moisture in the sample when I took it, as well as water holding capacity, which is the amount of water that the soil can hold upon saturation. I'm look, also looking at soil organic matter content and the percent total carbon and nitrogen in our soil. And I'm also very interested in how the nitrogen cycle is differing because that's it's suspected to be one of the, the main drivers of um, native plant performance in, in exotic soil. And so I'm particularly looking at the net mineralization and nitrification rates. I did some extractions of, of nitrate and ammonium from the soil. And then lastly, what I'm most excited about is that I am analyzing the soil microbial community with DNA analysis. And that will be able to tell us if we have a buildup of pathogens in one soil or a change in the nitrifier community, for example. And a lot of these soil measurements are very expensive. Um, and so that's, again, why I'm so grateful to you guys for awarding me this grant, because it's, it's making these analyses possible. So that was the conditioning phase. And now moving on to the feedback phase, I removed all the vegetation from those plots. I killed the, the native perennials, and then I flushed the seed bank uh, so I could then get rid of that seed bank. And then once I had those plots prepared, I seeded um, into subplots native species alone, the exotic species alone, and both of the natives and the exotics together, because I want just to make sure that I'm, you know, competition is so important uh, for in our grasslands. So I just want to have that taken into consideration. Okay. And so most experiments focus only on above ground uh, biomass as their feedback indicator, but new studies are showing that these feedbacks might be showing up in other life stages. And so I'm measuring as many life stages that I can. Um, so I did a germination experiment to see if germination of different species were suppressed in these two differing soils. And to do this, I actually glued around 2,000 seeds onto different colored toothpicks. Each color is a different species, and that took forever. And then I measured them. Well, I, I stuck them in the soil, and then I went out every day to check if they germinated. And then I also measured height at multiple time points throughout the growing season. I measured above and below ground biomass. And then I also looked at percent cover. Uh, throughout the growing season to see if maybe flowering times are differing. And then I also looked at seed production because maybe it might not matter how big you get if you can't produce any seed for that next generation. And then lastly, I also looked at seed viability. So I took these measures for two growing seasons and I just finished my data collection for the second growing season because our native perennials are long lived. So just one season wouldn't be enough. And hopefully my lab will continue to monitor these plots and take more of these uh, feedback measurements um, later on in time. But for my dissertation, I'm only focusing on these two growing seasons. 
And so moving forward, I still have to do several of my soil analyses, but all of my feedback data has been collected and about to be analyzed. Um, so in conclusion, I hope that my research will help elucidate some unknowns about our grassland soil and lead to improve the efficacy and success of native grassland restoration. Um, so thank you so much for your time and I hope to be able to update you uh, once I have results. Okay. Stop share. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. We were looking forward to seeing your results someday. Um, Judy, were there any questions? No, but we got several. Thank you. Oh, I got one. Where are your plots? Oh, yes. Sorry about that. So my plots are um, in Davis, California, in some departmental land. So they used to be agricultural fields, and then they laid fallow for around 20 years, filled with most of the exotic annual grasses before, before we prepped them for the experiment. Great. Um, let me see. Fascinating description. I think that's, we get a lot of thank yous and wonderful projects here. I don't see any other questions right now. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was awesome. All right. Thank you. No, oh, there's mm -hmm. a question. There's a question. Oh. oh, here's another one from Karen. Uh, what is the disruption in the nitrogen cycle? Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, it's kind of, we don't fully know what exactly will be um, because Previous studies on grasses like Avena and Bromus have kind of shown contradicting results. But at least with Medusa head and goat grass, their litter is very low quality and has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so it's very slow to decompose, which will affect the speed of the nitrogen cycle. Um, and then they've also been shown to actually change the composition of the nitrifying bacterial community. Um, so that just like will slow down the, the nitrogen cycle. Great. Um, I think that is it right now. Madeline, do you see anything else? No, I think uh, that's everything unless there's any late breaking questions. Nope. Um, okay. Lots of thank yous. I'm really, a lot of people are really enjoying your talk. Just thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. You are our first graduate student scholarship winner in 20 years that we've had by Zoom to speak at the chapter. So that's great. And um, good luck in your in your work. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so our next speaker is our headliner, Justin Whittle. Um, he was born locally in Santa Clara. He grew up running the trails in South County and surfing Santa Cruz beaches. He received his bachelor's degree from Santa Clara University and a master's from Oregon State. And then he came back to California and got his PhD at UC Santa Barbara in plant evolution for focusing on the North American columbines. He has been an associate professor at Santa Clara University in biology since 2007. And he's expanded his research to include flower color evolution in Arctic mustards, uh, Peria, Mediterranean campions, Silenes, and he also does conservation genetics and restoration ecology of Streptanthus and wallflowers, the Arisimums. So he is also the editor-in-chief of Madrono, which is a peer-reviewed quarterly journal from the California Botanical Society. That is a great magazine. And I will turn it over to Justin now. Please go ahead and take control. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, guys. I really am excited to be here. Let me uh, share my screen. I'm gonna stop your share, is that all right, Vivian? Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you see uh, some Coyote Ridge wildflowers? It looks wonderful. Thank you, great. Yeah, I, I really have to, um, say how in awe I am of your guys' dedication. I've seen a lot of people just kind of give up given the circumstances. Um, and not only uh, were you able to coordinate me and the student who just received her scholarship, but it looks like there's some 40, 50 people in the audience. And I, I'm really honored to be a, a 
part of that. So um, good job, Santa Clara County chapter. You guys have supported my students' research in the past, and we've been in conversation about continuing that. And I am really thankful for that part. I'm glad to be able to tell you some good news about um, Jewel Flowers and Coyote Ridge and uh, the general area in Southern Santa Clara County where I grew up. You can kind of see in the distance here, um, the, this is uh, looking out south toward, from the Coyote Ridge. Uh, I grew up in Santa Teresa area and spent a lot of time unknowingly as a kid playing around serpentine soils and then finally discovering the plants. So I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to be able to uh, share with you some of the research that we've done. I should say right at the outset that a large amount of this work was done in collaboration with Creekside Science. Uh, Stu Weiss is the principal investigator there. He's a good friend of mine and showed me some of the first jewel flowers on Cody Ridge over 10 years ago. And since then we've been working together um, in a collaboration where they do a lot of the uh, on the ground coordination of the access and data collection. And I help with some of the um, scientific portions and we all work together on um, all parts of the project. So uh, Crystal Niederer and Jimmy Canal and the whole team over there have been huge. In addition, I always involve undergraduates at Santa Clara University. We're primarily an undergraduate institution and I need to provide a shout out to them. You'll see them occasionally throughout the talk, but the, many of them have contributed significantly throughout uh, this project. So let's dive in. I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, some good news and then some really good news. First, the Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower, um, which is a controversial name, but right now I'll be using Streptanthus albidus, al uh, oh, albidus, that's supposed to be albidus albidus, uh, with a new occurrence and then a reintroduction uh, that we did and the results from 2015. And I have some 2020 updates from just the last couple of weeks. We've had permission to get out there and, um, and that's pretty exciting for us in many ways. And then, um, in regards to the most beautiful jewel flower, Streptanthus albidus paramoinus, that one is correctly named there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the history, some of the taxonomic history, some of the geographic history. We can talk a little bit about where its limits might be and some places that some of the members may have botanized in South County. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the uh, work we did on um, the phylogenetics, but I'd like to spend most of the time thinking about the color because it turns out that's the most controversial part about this taxon. It comes in a variety of shades of almost white to almost dark pink, and that becomes challenging for both um, scientists and practitioners and um, people who just like to get the right names, which I hope most of your people do. Finally, I have a, a little pollination experiment that we did and some more cutting edge next gen sequencing results indicating what genes might be responsible for those color differences. So that's where we're headed, let's see. What's up with the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower out at Tulare Hill? There we go. Um, the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower uh, was once thought to have almost 20 occurrences. Here I'm showing in white the five or six remaining occurrences. One of them is a new one we just um, relocated. That's uh, going to appear here in a second with an arrow. I think it's number zero, which is just to the southeast of 18. And uh, that's along Hellier uh, Road, right near Hellier Park. There's a large road cut on Hellier Road with a big orb that you can see from the highway. And we found jewel flowers speckled there, almost 100, 240 of them now, several years in a row. I should mention a couple of these other sites. The red ones uh, are extirpated. Uh, number 19 was extirpated from the Communications Hill area. Uh, Highway 87 goes right through the center of that, I believe. And we've looked for it for the last several years and have yet to relocate it there. But that's sort of the northern terminus of the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower historically. Um, and site number 11 is on Tulare Hill. That's just to the west of Highway 101, uh, not too far from Metcalf Road. There's an energy center there. They had some news a couple of years ago when there was some um, people shooting at it. And otherwise it, you tend to drive by it and not pay much attention except for when you go under all the wires. 
And the pink ones are fascinating because those have been previously identified as Metcalf Canyon jewel flower, but are, are all come in a light to dark pink color of the sepals. And they have a lightly, slightly less, um, slightly different morphology. And so those are now considered paramoinus or the most beautiful jewel flower. That's eight, four, and 20. 21 and, um, is kind of controversial. We can talk about that later. And number five and six are um, definitely the incorrect taxa. Five now we've identified. It's now underwater, but I have an herbarium specimen from Anderson Lake showing that that's probably paramoinus. Um, Excuse me, my computer wasn't catching up. There we go. This is what the new occurrence looks like. Can you guys see, just to confirm, a uh, jewel flower on the side of the road at Hellier Road? Anybody? Yes, you're good. Perfect, thank you. Um, so again, we saw over 200 individuals uh, between about 2013 and the last year. Um, they seem to be pretty stable um, and I'm excited to see. That's definitely an anthropogenic site. Uh, it's all serpentine grassland, but largely invaded by um, oats up above and a lot of a bare south, southwest facing exposure. Uh, which is um, good news that we're finding more and more. I think one of the lessons I've learned about this plant is uh, this is a plant that we're going to learn to live with. Uh, it, we're not going to have vast acreage of Coyote Ridge opening up in new places, but um, it looks like we're able to live with it at Hellier Road as long as it's managed properly. Uh, we embarked on a reintroduction after doing some of the baseline biology that I've talked about with the Santa Clara chapter previously. Um, and I won't go through a lot of the baseline biology, but it just suggested that Tulare Hill once harbored Metcalf Canyon jewel flower and would probably do it again. We studied the soils and the pollinators, did some genetic work, and all of those pointed to Tulare Hill um, as a good site. So the Bureau of Reclamation um, funded a multi-year reintroduction where we took seeds from throughout its range and spread them atop in very planned way. We used, um, here's a picture of Tulare Hill. We're looking north from Bailey uh, Road and you can see the Metcalf energy plant on the right there. That would be to the east and the wires go over the top. That's all serpentine grassland um, and you're looking at the south facing exposure and um, take a careful note of the, the left corner of the Tulare Hill there. It's kind of scrubby with some um, coastal sage scrub habitat there. And we didn't put any plots there, but it turns out that um, a recent fire occurred there and that seems to have sprung a huge number of um, Metcalf Canyon jewel flowers from our seeded plots that we'll talk about in a second. I did have to give a shout out to the Santa Clara chapter yet again for uh, helping with the seed cleaning. We cleaned um, tens of thousands of seeds and I know several of these people um, pictured in the top left there and the bottom left were very generous multi-day uh, volunteers cleaning seeds and weighing seeds such that we could prepare small envelopes for delivering them into the field. Some of the younger people in those pictures are my students. That's Julie Herman pictured in the center. She's getting her PhD in plant evolution at UC Santa Cruz. And Peter Biro in the right there, um, he was getting his master's degree at San Francisco State. And Crystal Nieder are shown from Creekside Science. And those people, all these people were essential for getting this um, project up and going. Uh, we had to get special permission to harbor a captive breeding population. That's typically terms used for um, keeping animals in captivity, but we had 250 um, plants. You'll see them rope there just to make sure they don't escape. Um, they were representative of all the genetic diversity that we could find, all the major populations. And we were gonna let nature sort out the um, genotypes because we didn't detect any um, genotypes that were more fit than others. We grew them at Santa Clara in multiple sites, just in case there was an outbreak of any types of 
uh, pathogens. And we were just um, talking about Phytophthora. It's a major um, pathogen on plants. So you'll see these are all um, raised off of the ground. There's no standing water. And we were particularly conscientious about that. Um, the winter of 2013-2014 was uh, one of the driest on record, and we wanted to wait for the first rain, and we waited through November and December, and then we waited into January, and it was finally near the end of February when we finally got some critical mass of rain, not realizing that these plants actually needed more of a cold treatment than they did a rain treatment, because we planted some 60,000 seeds and we got six germinates. That was a little disappointing in the spring of 2014, but luckily, um, unless birds ate those seeds, uh, I think very few of them die. They last for at least 10 years in our lab and um, we get 90 to 95% germination. So it was more of a seed bank restoration in 2014. Thankfully, I suspect the majority of those seeds were um, buried and then they went through their summer and then a winter. And the majority of the data I'm gonna show you now are the blocks that we seeded um, in both March of 2014. And then we learned our lesson and just decided to seed in the fall of 2014 for its winter and the spring. And the rains were much better. You'll see some plots that we have there. We put some plots in an exclosure. If you look behind Stu in his green jacket there, you'll see the barbed wire where we were keeping cattle out because cattle are brought there seasonally to um, to range and that helps keep some of the invasive grasses down, but we also didn't want them eating jewel flowers. So we wanted to check excluded uh, grazed versus ungrazed treatments. And um, those are what the plots that I'll show you in a minute here. Oh, you can see the seeds going into the ground there. Uh, we mix them with some sand to help uh, evenly disperse the seeds within a plot. So I'm gonna show you four blocks. That's four different spots at Tulare Hill. And of those four blocks, each one had a grazed and an ungrazed set of plots. And within there, there were many plots uh, within each grazed and ungrazed site. There's gonna be a lot of numbers here, I'll just warn you, but let's keep our eyes on the totals at the bottom and a little bit of a comparison between the grazed and the ungrazed. We started by looking at how many germinated in December. Now this is not the first year when we only had six germinate. This is the second year after that. And we started to get it into the hundreds uh, uh, per plot and had a total of almost 5,000 seeds germinate. Of course, we, we had at that point planted 120,000 seeds. So a small proportion, but a measurable proportion. So those numbers can only go down because those are the germinants. This is the amount that survived to the juvenile stage in March of 2015. And you'll see um, it's been reduced by about 30%. And then survival to maturation, that's reproductive maturation in September. That means it made some kind of reproductive structures, flowers or fruits. And you'll see another 60% reduction there. So the majority of the attrition occurs between March and September. And that's probably due to the late spring and summer, early summer drought. On each one of the plants that was reproductive, that's the 1,160, we counted every fruit. That's a silique in the mustard family. They're either long and skinny siliques or they're short and fat silicles. In this case, we've got siliques with about 30 seeds each. And we counted about 4,050 fruits in total. That means each plant made on average about three to four fruits. And so if you compare those first numbers with the last numbers there, we have 4,000 fruits and we started with 4,733 plants. That means we removed 4,733 seeds from the seed bank that we had gener uh, restored. And after removing 4,733, um, we've produced 4,050 fruits. Now there's a factor of 30 because every fruit produces approximately 30 seeds. So the fact that these two numbers are similar indicates that we have about a 30 fold gain in seed production because this is gonna make 30 times that number of seeds. In addition to the overall uh, success in terms of at least replacing the number of seeds we started with and maybe even growing it, we also have a pretty substantial and significant grazed versus ungrazed effect. If you look within a block controlling for the local environment, you'll see substantially more uh, 
plants survived and plants reproduced in the grazed than in the ungrazed, and that's true across the board. The most dramatic result that was completely unexpected by me was the variation in the number of fruits per plant. We expected that most plants would make an average of five to 10 fruits. We did a lot of back of the envelope calculations to see how many we would need to seed. And you'll see a plant here on the left with only four fruits. It's a relatively small plant, not making a lot of fruits. And a plant over here on the right, which I counted at least 40, and there's probably more not shown in the picture, 40 fruits. Keep in mind, each one of those has about 30 seeds inside. I was hoping there would be something predictable about the factors that control whether there's four fruits or 40 fruits. And we tried just about everything, percent cover of natives, percent cover of non-natives, percent bare ground, aspect, slope, um, even some soil chemistry. And we couldn't find any correlates. And having spent a lot of time with our heads over these plots, it was pretty clear that there's a very local microclimate effect. When there was a boulder of serpentine about football size on the north side of that boulder, I think if there were seeds there, there would be a plant and there would be a very robust sport of a plant. If there was a plant in an open space that was exposed to the south facing slope, even a small south facing slope, just a little angle, that plant would be small and make fewer fruits. The plants were trying to tell us something about where they liked to be and where they didn't like to be. Unfortunately, those lessons were extremely local and the idea of being able to pick those spots and those spots being consistent year to year um, is unlikely. So we decided to take more of a showering approach. That is, put the seeds everywhere and then let the seeds tell you where they're happy. These types of variation in fruit production generates what's known in biology, in population biology, in population ecology as a sweepstakes reproduction. This is where, uh, just like playing the lottery, a few people win a lot of money. For example, if you compare the percent of plots, now this is all the, this is only 30% of the plots, I'm not even showing all of them. And this is the percent of all the fruits, the 100% here represents that 4,000 number you can generate half of all the fruits that we ever produced with only 4% of the plots. That was 4% of the plots. And then if you get to 10% of the plots, you get almost 80% of all the reproduction. And if you want 90% of the reproduction, you only need to be at about um, 18, 18 to 19% of all the plots. This is the sweepstakes reproduction pattern where a few individuals, um, win big, they have a lot of fruits. We wanted to try to high grade for that. And uh, like I said, I think that is gonna be on a very local scale. An exciting finding this season uh, was that we were able to go out and do a complete census of all of the previous plots. The exclosures have been removed now. So the, the, they've been breached and cattle have been in and out. So there's no longer a grazed and ungrazed effect, but the golf course and the neighborhood sites had plants. They didn't have very many plants. Those are reproductive plants in this past spring, summer. 310 at the golf course and 95 at the neighborhood. These are two of our blocks on the north side. And on the south side, we have the Santa Teresa block and this Metcalf um, Energy Center block. And um, Santa Teresa block had a few and the Metcalf Energy Center was doing quite well with over 4,600 plants. For us, that was really exciting because that's more than we had across all of the blocks after the first year or two. The plants were clearly trying to tell us something that there was, um, that they were finding these sites were okay and they were persisting at small levels. What I'd like to point to are these two spots on the southwest and southeast corners of that steep south facing Tulare Hill slope that I showed you. We found 600 plants here to the left and over 2,900 of them to the right on the southeast corner. Now these are not spots that had been seeded. These are seeds that had rained down from above and we're almost positive that they are not part of a, a historical seed bank because people have been looking, including us, for plants here for the last 10 to 15 years. There was a fire um, right off of uh, Santa Teresa Boulevard here. It raged up the uh, slope here and there was a lot of disturbance. And we do see across Highway 101, there's a motorcycle park and where the motorcycles occasionally go off trail, jewel flowers appear. And there's this interesting 
um, dynamic between motorcycles and disturbance and jewel flowers at that location. And here it appears to be fire related. Of course, fire more likely to be the natural phenomenon, but maybe this is part of the story about living with jewel flowers. We work with the rangers. They have a nice um, kids ranger program at the motorcycle park where they show kids how to ride motorcycles responsibly. And um, they talk about the jewel flower and we talk about the needs of the jewel flower and how maybe the motorcycle park and some of the plants can coexist. It's a unexpected collaboration, but um, we seem to be able to manage a pretty substantial population at the motorcycle park. And I'm excited to see this new group of plants that are telling us that they found a happy place that was best of all of our hard work to find those plots and identify which ones they were, those plants found a better spot. Whenever possible, I try to let the plants choose. Hey, so this is a good time to take a break. That's what I had to offer on the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower. And I leave you with a picture of the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower on the left here with the white sepals and the most beautiful jewel flower on the uh, right with the light pink sepals. And this would be a good time to ask questions if you um, had any. Yes, we've got a couple. Um, first of all, back to the coastal sage scrub you mentioned on Tulare Hill on the west side. Can you tell us what the components of that were? Was it um, softer leaves uh, sages or? What was the plants there, do you know? Yeah, it's mostly Artemisia californica, um, almost entirely. There are some other uh, salvias in there. I think there's black sage, salvia mellifera. Um, we didn't put our plots right in there, so I didn't spend a lot of time in those particular spots. Our plots are kind of, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, our plots are kind of right on this rise here. It turns out there's a little, um, a little dell or a gap between this and this. Um, and we put our plots right near the top. That's where our um, models suggested that there was gonna be the most um, solar radiance. And that was supposed to predict the, where the jewel flowers like. Now they have creeped down and this is where some of those plants were and the other plants were over here on these really scorching south facing slopes, which over the last week were probably, you know, over 100, 110 degrees um, open, barren. Um, and great habitat for jewel flowers. Great. Um, we had a question. Nice to see the container plants and to hear of your pathogen prevention measures. Were you able to test for Phythophthora? Oh, definitely. Um, and I should mention, we have a couple projects going on in the greenhouse and out in those outdoor growing facilities. And uh, although uh, you could potentially pass Phytophthora through seeds, I think that's... Um, poorly known and probably much rarer than since it's a root rotting pathogen, more likely in a root uh, of a plant that's been transplanted like a chaparral shrub. We know we've had trouble with some of those in the Coyote Ridge area in the past, as well as um, we were growing some erysimums. I don't know, can you see my erysimum? I brought a little okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is a native plant society. Uh, we're growing some erysimums, erysimum capitatum. Uh, this, this is what this is, and we're growing a lot of Arisimum teridifoliums uh, for some in reintroduction. And we also do the same thing for that because we're actually planting seedlings. So um, I'm less concerned about Phytophthora moving through seeds as I am through the roots of a seeded plant. So all very important questions. Thank you. Got a couple more if you have time. Um, I, may, I might have missed this, but where were the seeds collected? Oh, yeah. Uh, I showed a map earlier. I can show the map again right here. Uh, yeah. So all of the white points are extant populations of the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower. And we were able to collect a very small amount of seeds from nature. And then we bulked them by growing those 250 plants from those. So we didn't want to impact the native population, collecting on the order of like five to 10 seeds per plant from about is up to 50 or 100 plants per population. And then we grew our captive breeding population from that. So it represents the extent of genetic diversity that we know of from the, the subspecies. And um, that was only justified because that's a bit controversial. You often want to use local seed, um, but in this case, local is all of the populations and we haven't detected any local adaptation or um, signs that mixing them would decrease fitness. In fact, we have a slight evidence that it would improve fitness. 
Okay. Um, did you find a relationship between the size of the plant and the number of fruits? Definitely. A very okay. strong height by number of fruits. We didn't actually measure the height of the plant. We, we counted the fruits. Um, in the end of the day, what we wanted to know was uh, an evolutionary measure of fitness. That is the ability of the plants to survive and then the ability of it to reproduce. It would have been great to count every seed. That would have been the real um, measure of fitness. But uh, we took an average of the number of seeds and counted the fruits. But yes, definitely the taller plants had more fruits. Okay. Um, more questions coming in. So if any of these are uh, referring to the second half of your presentation, let us know. So rechart with the blocks and blocks and grays slash ungrazed block two in 2015 was the significant jump in plants. Was there a fire there? Um, can you read it one more time, Judy? Sure. Um, so block two in 2015 was the significant jump in plants. Was there a fire? Ah, block two, 2015. There, there is a huge number of fruits in block two, um, but mm -hmm. there were no fires on Tulare Hill um, before the one last summer in the recent past. So um, the answer to the question is no. Um, this block two is on the more northern side, and we thought that was going to be the more successful side based on this first set of um, data points. I think what they're pointing at is the 1934 fruits. Um, if the person's in the audience, I don't know if it's okay to just ask them to unmute themselves and confirm. Is that allowed, Judy? Um, yeah, no, I can unmute them if I can find them. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm answering their question. Yeah. Okay. I've asked them to unmute. So um, you know who you are? Um, no, I, I was, I was just, I mean, that's such a significant number. Um, you know, just looking at your chart, and I didn't know if it was something soil related or fire related. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, what's your name? April. April. Thank you for asking. Yes, um, this is more than two times, almost three times the next highest number, which is this uh, plot number four. It was on the north side of Tulare Hill and that during this particular um, measuring season, 2014, 2015, I think the plants benefited from being on that north side. They were a little bit more protected from some particularly scalding heat and drought periods. Um, more recently, when we have wetter seasons, they do better on the south side. So some of these sites like site number uh, one and site number three that did medium to poor, relatively speaking, um, those are the ones that are just going off right now. The Metcalf Energy, um, I think, is this number three. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, at the two sites that were not manually seeded, the two southernmost sites, were you able to compare the soil chemistry to the other sites which were manually seeded? Oh, wow. These are great questions. Uh, we haven't gotten that yet because we only got these numbers. Literally, uh, I got them earlier today, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. And I think they were collected less than a week ago or so. So uh, we would love to know if there's a soil component there. Um, if I had to hypothesize, because we've looked at a lot of soil across Tulare Hill on really fine scales and then really broad scales, like on the order of meters to on the order of dozens of kilometers. And serpentine soils are heterogeneous, but in not a very predictable way. I would suggest that those sites uh, are probably um, more barren, so there's less competition, and they're getting a lot more solar radiation. And as long as you have enough precipitation, solar radiation is going to be um, improving uh, germination, survival, and reproduction until you get drought, and then everything changes. Great. Uh, they keep coming in, so we'll just keep going until you say we'll move on. No, that's uh, okay. So how are they pollinated? That's a question. Um, I want to just remind everybody, put the questions to everybody and not privately to the host. Of the OK, perfect. Um, I do have some pollinator. Um, data to share regarding the most beautiful jewel flower, um, but just very briefly, more than 99% of visits that we've measured with video cameras across multiple days and years are done by a single species of bumblebee, Bombus vosnesecii. It is not a uh, particularly rare, in fact, it's one of the most common bumblebees in California. It has two stripes of yellow on its back end is one of the distinctive features that's um, and so a couple of honeybees sneak into our video cameras, but that's about it.
uh, how are they? Oh, you already said how they pollinate. The disturbance related germination near the motor park is really neat. Do you know what kind of stimuli might be causing the spike in germination in those spaces? I wish. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of competition going on, and we know that a general phenomenon about serpentine endemics, particularly plants that have gone completely onto serpentine and are never found off of serpentine or very rarely, um, that they can't return to non-serpentine habitat, not because they can't deal with normal, normal chemistry, but because they can no longer compete. So serpentines are kind of an oasis if you can deal with the chemistry. That is this high magnesium, low calcium ratio, often some heavy metals, really low macronutrients. So I think um, the reason why the disturbance increases uh, germination and success is more of have to do with competition there's also probably some uh, aerating of the soil that matters, and we're now discovering that in the sand hills of the Santa Cruz Mountains with Aristomum tritifolium, this wallflower that's also a mustard, um, and it has orders of magnitude more success if you aerate the soils by turning it over, digging it up a little bit, rather than um, planting in compacted sand hill soil. Slightly different edaphic phenomenon, but I think it might um, speak to what's happening there at the motorcycle park. Uh, we had a kind of a similar question to whether grazing helped or hurt. Yeah, uh, we had them in inside the exclosure, so no grazing, and they had, uh, I think it was three to four times on average higher um, fruit set than outside. So some of the cows are nibbling on the fruits. Um, now that the exclosures have been breached and removed, uh, we no longer have significant differences inside and out, but um, the treatments are no longer in existence. It was mostly done for the first year and second year as uh, to get us past a little threshold where we could have enough plants that, yeah, cows might eat a few of them, but then they won't eat them all. We didn't want cows to eat all of them the first year around. Probably not. That probably wouldn't help. Exactly. Um, so we had a comment too on that, on the cattle issue. A few cattle runners have endorsed light cattle use, few hooves that have had good result. The theory is that in years gone by, herds of wild animals were comparatively small. And I know we do have elk on Coyote Ridge as well, so. Right, and you know, uh, we do, I think a lot in, in deep time, it's hard for me because I'm used to, you know, tens and twenties and thirties of years, but we know that this subspecies has been around and its close relatives are all on serpentine. So it's probably been around and on serpentine for the last 100 to 200,000 years. And we know that the large um, herbivore community has changed dramatically since then. And uh, at some point, not that long ago, we had, you know, really large, you know, big um, mastodons or mammoths coming through and they surely caused an amazing amount of disturbance, but then they would move on and there wouldn't be, you know, thousands of them in a, uh, a, a feedlot style, but instead more of a passing through. Okay, I thought I had one more, but then I just popped up. So one more is, uh, when in the season do the seeds germinate? Oh, yeah. Uh, they'll grow, germinate after the first rain, and if the first rain is until March, then that's when we saw six of them germinate, unfortunately, out of about 60,000. And if they um, get rained on closer to November or December, they'll germinate then. And that's kind of their normal, normal phenology is a germination in November uh, and sometime between October and December, they'll stay pretty small seedlings and they don't grow very fast in the cold of short days of winter, but come January, February, they'll start putting out two, four, six, eight leaves and then we'll see them bolt. Great, so we had a question about how do the populations maintain genetic diversity, i.e. gene flow, e.g. gene flow. So I'm not sure if you're gonna be talking about that later in the second half or? No, I can address that now. Can you repeat it one more time so I make sure I get the details? How do these populations maintain genetic diversity, e.g. gene flow? Right, um, well, we know the plants can uh, flow genes in two ways. Uh, genes can flow in plants by pollinators moving pollen or the gametes during reproduction. And then they can also uh, gene flow during seed dispersal. And so we know that bumblebees are the most likely, I've got a basket hound <laughs> helping me out here. Uh, we know that um, bumblebees can fly up to one or two kilometers with and be active pollinators or active um, um, 
vectors of gene flow uh, up to like about two kilometers, so at least. Um, so I'm sure some genes are moving that way. And now we've known and we have quantified the distance that seeds can move mostly downhill on this south facing slope of Tulare Hill. Um, so in that way, I'm excited to actually measure that and we can make some estimates on what would happen over longer periods of time. Okay, one more and then I think we probably should move on just to make sure we don't run till 930 or something. Okay, but, um, why did the seeds need cold treatment to be able to germinate successfully? Oh my gosh, these are great questions and uh, questions that also puzzled me for some time. I always thought that seeds should germinate when they get wet, but we all know from the Santa Clara County and you know other parts of California that occasionally there'll be a midsummer rain, like a south, we call it Chubasco or a, a Pineapple Express rain. And if all, if California native plants germinated when they got touched by rain, then they might pop out in the middle of July or August. And you know what it's like the next week or two after that, they'll probably get fried to a toast. A much more reliable predictor of the, um, of the seasons is the cold treatment and particularly the length of the cold treatment rather than just responding to precipitation. And so uh, there's some fascinating interactions between plant hormones like gibberellic acid that um, the cold treatment will um, eventually initiate and then the plant will germinate. But it's um, pretty common in California plants that I've worked on um, to require uh, somewhere between a week and a, a month cold treatment. We just put them on a wet filter paper in a petri dish because I like to see them germinate and then plant them. You can also just put the pot in the fridge for a week or two if you if it's easier. Great. Um, the only other question we had was about Streptanthus glandulosa glandulosa, but I, I told them that's a coming attraction. So Perfect. Okay, that's it for now. Should we go there now? Uh, no, if you, however you want to resume the talk is great. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Streptanthus glandulosus. Uh, so I'm now onto the really good news of this most beautiful jewel flower, which is Streptanthus albida subspecies paramoinus, but it depends on who you ask. I'd like to give you a little history, talk about a bit about the geography, um, something about uh, our understanding of relationships using these things called AFLPs very briefly, and I spend most of the time on the color, and then some pollinator work, and finally, a little next gen sequencing that's called the transcriptome. But here's our Kirkeberg, he's a hero of mine. Uh, he worked on a diversity of plants and um, one in particular was this glandulosus complex. And at the time that he was working, it was named Streptanthus albidus and Streptanthus glandulosus. And he um, wasn't using paramoinus at the time, but these uh, lines indicate the crosses that he made in common garden and the amount of seeds that were produced. And if they produce seeds, did those offspring have viable pollen? That is, was the pollen function. And so the dark bars suggest a lot of interfertility and the dotted line suggests some levels of it reproductive isolation. And although this is fascinating for horticultural reasons, I love to try to make crosses between disparate lineages and see what comes out. Um, it's a very important evolutionary study because when you start to have low interfertility, these are barriers to gene flow. And that is the initiation of a new species. And eventually the process of speciation uh, will ensue. Uh, he was using primarily crossing studies to do this. And the uh, take home lesson for this is that within glandulosis and these two subspecies, you have a lot of interfertility between glandulosis and these other things, there is a lot of um, reproductive isolation. Sorry, my slides went back to the beginning. Let's see, there's our Kirkberg and. So there's your Streptanthus albidus albidus. Uh, this is Streptanthus albidus paramoinus, and this is Streptanthus glandulosus. We have some neighborhood uh, howlers at eight o'clock. They're missing me today, but in case you're here in the background, that's our two-legged coyotes. We uh, actually had that in our last talk too, so you're keeping with the tradition. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Mike Meyer from University of San Diego and a student of his, Becetta, in 2010 published this uh, estimate of relationships. And I don't want to spend a lot of time um, belaboring phylogenetic analysis, but what it does show here is that there is strong geographic structure within Streptanthus glandulosus. 
he defines a northeastern clade and then a Bay Area clade and then this southern clade. And let's kick our attention to this southern clade. You'll see some albidus albidus, albidus paraminus, and some glandulosus. In fact, he has a couple of uh, paraminus in here. You'll see one here and two over here. And then he has one albidus albidus. And it was based on that alone um, that he and Al Shabazz, another mustard um, taxonomist, decided that these three things actually were one entity. And therefore, it was a conservative taxonomic judgment. And I'm a big fan of that. We don't need you know species that don't exist. But I was a little surprised because these top two are protected species at different degrees, but they are both um, protected species. And glandulosus is relatively common in this part of um, the southern central coast or the central coast range. So by synonymizing them into one thing called glandulosus, the southern clade, they quickly removed all protections from that. Uh, luckily, the Native Plant Society out of Sacramento um, was um, very thoughtful in asking me how to interpret this. And I strongly suggested that until we have more data, because the data here is based on honestly one or at most two DNA differences that actually have very low reliability, um, that we should probably maintain these identifications until we have further evidence that they're truly one species. Thankfully, Native Plant Society uh, is maintaining those recognitions and therefore um, the, a lot of agencies have um, kept with that. We were hoping that some work out of UC Davis on the phylogeny, the relationships of the entire genus pictured here on the left with some fascinating floral diversity in the, in the group of Sotanthus. You'll see these colorful bracts that sometimes provide a, a flower color contrast, white sepals and petals with a nice purple bract. Um, and a, a huge amount of variation in the shape. Here the sepals have these long wings. The phylogenetic study of all these guys, and this is uh, the um, Calanthus amplexicollis from the uh, Santa Barbara area, the backcountry behind Santa Barbara with its inflated stem, for example. Um, we were hoping that this phylogenetic study would have solved the problem of the relationships and clarified it. And so here's the study of the, all of the genus. And if you're interested in jewel flowers, this is kind of like a, a big gold mine for all sorts of exciting questions and understandings. But unfortunately, here is the glandulosus complex. And to translate here, this big triangle means that there are a bunch of things in this complex and that they have no idea how they're related. That was a little disappointing. That took several genes and many years uh, study by Eva Lou Caucho and Sharon Strauss out of Davis, an amazing um, amount of work and a great study outside of this particular group, but it didn't solve the conservation question at hand. So let me show you a little bit about the geography so we know what we're talking about, and then we're going to go into uh, what my phylogenetic results suggested. Here we are in South County, Southern Santa Clara County. This is this little wing here called the called Coyote Ridge. And you'll see it kind of disintegrates into Communications Hill uh, around here. And that's where the last known northernmost jewel flower, uh, Metcalf Canyon jewel flower. Right around here is Tulare Hill. You can see the little nub here of Tulare Hill. And that's where the Metcalf Canyon breaks this Coyote Ridge into two halves. Lots of fascinating plants there at Metcalf Canyon, maybe the Native Plant Society. Uh, we can meet up out there sometime. Everything to the north of Metcalf Canyon, um, give or take a couple of um, dozen meters, have white sepals, almost entirely white sepals. And everything to the south has some range of pigmented sepals. Some of them are pretty darn white and some of them can get pretty dark pinky purple. But largely on average, we see the pigmented stuff to the south and the white to the north. Now, I know some people uh, in the audience may have been to Rancho Cañada del Oro, or they've seen jewel flowers at Calero or San Vicente. I see them regularly at Santa Teresa Park at um, the Stiles Ranch switchbacks, for example. Um, there's also some fascinating things going on down here south of Coyote Ridge near Anderson Reservoir where we get a, a new species altogether called tortuosus. Our current hypothesis is that everything to the west of Highway 101 is 
streptanthus glandulosus because they are fixed for the same color purple in, um, in my experience. And everything to the east of that on Coyote Ridge is either Streptanthus albatus albatus or albatus paramoinus. Um, but I'm really excited to hear from your membership and from people who spend a lot of time out in the field and have seen these things to, um, to take a careful survey of the population and are there light ones and medium ones and dark ones or are they all pretty much the same? I know over here in Santa Teresa Park and in um, Kenyatta del Oro, the populations are relatively fixed for the same color purple, whereas in these paramoinus populations, they're quite variable. Some pictures I'd like to show you in that regard. Of course, Coyote Ridge is famous for its jewel flowers, but there is a little known butterfly called the Bay Checker Spot that it was made famous for some studies of population dynamics in Stanford and Jasper Ridge, where it's been extirpated and then a several of the Creekside people that I work with also um, work on the butterfly and its populations at both the Coyote Ridge and it turns out at Tulare Hill are doing quite well and that's the refuge for this species. So I had to show some charismatic macrofauna, at least macrolepidoptera in that case. There's two butterflies there, by the way. Um, we did our own phylogenetic analysis using not just a couple of markers like the Mayer study, but 634 of these markers scattered throughout the, the genome, like across all the chromosomes. Um, we have populations from across the range of all three species, and they tend to cluster together. All of the albatus albatus samples can be shown here from Metcalf all the way uh, through um, several other, Silver Creek, Motorcycle Park, for example. The Paramoinus samples, that's the most beautiful jewel flower, can all be found in these lineages. And separately from them, and distinct, quite distinct, are the glandulosa samples. So the original study I showed you of Art Krukeberg, who was doing the crosses, and he showed glandulosus crosses with itself, but cannot cross with albatus, seems to reflect what we're finding in this larger, more, thoroughly um, sampled AFLP phylogeny. Now the glandulosus is distinct from these other two and whether these two are distinct or not at the moment relies largely on a flower color characteristic which is variable in paramoinus and that can be a challenge. So let's focus in on that. That is the distinction between albatus, albatus and albatus paramoinus. I should mention that this phylogeny isn't completely um, resolved. There's a couple of, there's one paramoinus over here. There's a Metcalf over here. And this is the type of pattern you'd expect when two lineages have just recently diverged and there's still some ancestral variation that hasn't gotten sorted out yet. Or maybe occasionally there's gene flow like was asked earlier by bees or seeds um, between these different populations. So here's a picture from some work we did with the Creekside team. We went to the Paramoinus populations and you can see that we collected stems to quantify color from some of the lightest, nearly white sepulled plants all the way through to some of the darkest. They look like Streptanthus glandulosus from Santa Teresa Park. And we see just about everything in between. What we were trying to do is we're trying to one, understand the variation at a biological scale. That is, what is the actual ecology and evolution of the flower color differences? Is it a continuous gradation or is there these natural breaks between white, light, and dark? After doing that, we want to try to apply what we've learned in the flower color to some kind of field ready, um, implementable tool that land managers can use to try to identify these uh, populations because they're trying to manage it. It's a um, species of concern and they wanna make sure they know how many occurrences they have, but they don't know what they have because some of them are light and some of them are dark and is it glandulosus or is it paramoinus or maybe there's a couple white ones and it should be called a Metcalf Canyon jewel flower. And the whole thing gets to be somewhat, in, somewhat of a conservation nightmare when you're forced to put these things into little piles. It has to be this or this or that. One of the themes that we're gonna to get to here is that maybe we are in the process of some kind of ecological and evolutionary um, divergence and we should try to preserve the process more so than the actual 
end products because we're not there at the end of the story yet, clearly in this case. I've got a couple tools to introduce you to, a UV-Vis spectrometer. Uh, you can use a spectrophotometer for that, which is a, in a laboratory, or a portable color emitter, which I'll show you in a sec. We tried with some digital photographs. You could just use your cell phone and take pictures, but without the controlling for the amount of light, it turns out you can have pretty large effects on the color of the image by just taking a picture in the sun versus the shade, and that was gonna be a problem. But you can take pictures in what's called the raw mode. And if you have a white standard in the picture, then you can correct for that and maybe estimate the flower color by the number of R, G, and B pixels that light up. You're probably familiar with the RGB system for measuring color in a digital image. Um, and finally, maybe the best implementation is to use some kind of paint chips. Um, you can see them in the back corner here, by the way. This is what the Dunn Edwards $30 pack or $60 pack looks like. Um, we fo focus primarily on the pinks and the purples, as you can see there. Well, this is what the UV-Vis spectrometer does. And I'm gonna argue that that probably gives us the most reliable measurement of flower color because it measures the amount of light reflected from the ultraviolet. That's everything below 400 nanometers. We can only see starting at 400. So this is all ultraviolet and all the way to 700, which is over here in the reds, and then that becomes infrared, which we can't see past 700. This is a device that I use in the laboratory. It's not very portable. It's somewhat expensive, but it gives you high accuracy in the flower color. That's what the line, the dark line in the middle is the average reflectance of a white flower. These are the sepals, by the way, of albatus albatus. And this is the most beautiful jewel flower colored pink because it, most of them are pink, but you'll see there's a little bit more variation there. And finally, the glandulosis, which is a much darker color. And the pattern that I'd like to draw your attention to is first over here in the UV, there's not much change going on. The, there's no individual species that has high reflectance. So there's no secret uh, nectar guides for um, pollinators, which isn't surprised because it's mostly just offering pollen as a reward and it's pretty easy to find the front of the flower. The pigments are anthocyanins. Those are the flavonoids um, that have a lot of health benefits. That's the health benefits in chocolate, for example. It's the health benefits that some people claim from red wine. Um, those anthocyanins have absorbance here around 550 nanometers and you'll see how the pink ones are being pulled down. The amount of light that's reflected is reduced because these pigments are absorbing that light. And then in the dark ones, they're absorbing even more of that light. So again, this is a great way to quantify the color. And we could do this for 100 flowers or a couple hundred flowers. But this is clearly not something that a land manager would want to do or could do reasonably effect efficiently. Another way we might do this is with biochemistry. And I don't want to give a lecture on biochemistry because I know a lot more about mustards than I do about biochemistry, but uh, it's relatively straightforward to extract the anthocyanins from the sepals. So that's what you're seeing here is about eight sepals. That's two flowers worth because they have four sepals in each flower. Eight sepals um, extracted with methanol, a little bit of hydrochloric acid to maintain the stability of the pigment. And up here, you'll see the dark purple streptanthus glandulosus. And sure enough, they're pretty homogeneous. And my pho photographing technique of these plates is um, poor with the flash in the middle. But here's the streptanthus albatus albatus. And we did happen to bump into some with a little bit of light pink in them. You'll see it there, but otherwise almost entirely white without pigment. And these are the Streptanthus albatus paramoina samples. We had a lot more of those because we wanted to sa sample a lot of populations with the variation. And each population was uh, sorted by lightest to darkest based on their paint chip colors. And you'll see that they are pretty consistent that way, lightest to darkest, and then it'll reset and go lightest to darkest. And then it resets. We have three or four populations in there. The biochemistry is also gonna be really high accuracy, but for a different reason, it's gonna be more of a chemical estimate than for example, a visual estimate. We put this on what's called a plate reader and the plate reader shines light through the bottom. It's transparent through the bottom and it measures how much light passes through and how much is absorbed by the pigments. This allows us another high accuracy way to quantify whether this is gonna be a continuous gradation or it's gonna be a stepwise. And I wish I had the results for you, but we were just able to get into the lab this summer um, for long enough to um, start collecting this data and it hasn't been completely analyzed, but it's promising that between the 
UV vis spectrometer and the biochemistry, we're going to have an answer to whether or not this is a continuous gradation of color in paramoinus or it has more of a stepwise function. Once we identify what the gold standard is for color, then we can use it to see what methods might approach that. Let me introduce you to a Pantone x ray colorimeter. Uh, there it is there, but it's right here. And um, it's a fascinating little device here. It's handheld, it's portable, it's not too expensive. And uh, it does some things that my digital camera can't do. For example, it has this little white standard that opens up the display and that device there will shoot light in all wavelengths. If I turn it on, can you see some wavelengths of light? No, look at them go. Anybody? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, you see some different yeah, colors. Yeah, we, we see it. Perfect. What it's doing is it's shining all the wavelengths of light. It's looking for a flower or something comparable to um, analyze. And so, for example, you could take a, a begonia, only because it's pretty well known to be red, and you can press this up against it, and you can first standardize it with the white standard. The nice thing about this is that uh, it has a white standard built right into it. That's the cover. And then you can put it on your begonia, hold it there, and take a quick survey. And three seconds later, it tells you, uh, that's not gonna come through very well, but it tells you that it's red. Yeah, not sure. Um, and in fact, it doesn't just tell you that it's red, but it tells you what the hue, the chroma, and the brightness are. And this is an important way to quantify a color because we all see things differently and have different vocabulary we use to describe colors. And that's hard to manage endangered species that way. So we're trying to get some kind of a value. I was really hopeful that this was going to be a uh, gold standard for, and a field ready gold standard for color, it has some limitations. One, it costs $1,500, but the US Forest Service has gone all in and they use it regularly to quantify uh, soil color, which it has similar um, qualitative barriers. That is, I think this is brown, somebody else says it's tan, and they need to quantify that for management purposes. Um, they use this regularly. Unfortunately, it's made for interior design. <laughs> I talk to a lot of people whose job it is to match the color of a paint of a wall. And they said, this thing is perfect. You put it up against the flat wall and you get amazing accuracy on exactly the name of the style of the paint and the hue, chroma, and brightness, which you can go to Don Edwards and get that exact type of paint ordered. We turns out not all flowers are as flat as a wall and not of all of them are made as big as a begonia, uh, as a um, bougainvillea, sorry. Uh, and so when you get small flowers and you get flowers with three dimensional textures to them, it was a little bit challenging to get the sepals of those jewel flowers, for example, to fit into that viewable window without some variation. So we're still working on those details, more to come on that. And here are the paint chips. The paint chips are probably gonna be the most likely estimate that field um, people will use for the most beautiful jewel flower. And we're just trying to determine uh, at what proportion or what percent accuracy they are going to approach our gold standard. And we're not there yet, but I wanted to show you what it looks like. We took this uh, collection of $60 paint chips, which is a huge collection, probably a couple hundred, and we reduced it down to about uh, 10 of them or so, some of them shown here in a little plastic array. And, it turns out you need some training. You need to uh, know exactly how to use them. And then you have to use them in the same light environment as often as possible around midday with full sun. So there are some limitations to it, but um, comparatively speaking, um, they are quite uh, reliable. And we are trying to now test whether two separate observers without communicating with each other can um, land on the same paint chip or not. And the reliability is quite high. Uh, we're trying to quantify that now and that's still to come. It uses this Munzel color space, which is based on hue, chroma and brightness, which are the three values that my um, Pantone x ray also produces. So if you're interested in colors, I can talk to you about colors all day long. This is one of my favorite things and I'm really excited about doing it um, to try to help out conservation of this endangered species.
I just put together a quick summary here and I don't wanna go through all the details except to let you know that we've um, compared at least five different um, methods. I didn't talk much about the digital images, but we're working on two different uh, flavors of that. I think there's a couple of gold standards here with really high accuracy that we're um, sleuthing out right now. Unfortunately, they're for indoors or laboratory and they're either uh, really expensive or they require a laboratory with instrumentation, which isn't very practical but a good way to start the study. The color meter might be helpful, but I'm not completely convinced of that yet. It is field ready, but a little bit pricey to dive into. Um, the digital images might work. It'd be really handy if cell phones, cell phone cameras would work, but the light environment has to be the same in every picture or you have to have a white standard. And the paint chips is our hope for a field ready, relatively inexpensive and broadly useful approach. That's how we're gonna to try to identify which populations are Paramoanus, which are Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower, and which are some combination. And when we find these combinations, we'll have to decide whether we try to force them into these pigeonholed taxonomic units or whether we can take a more progressive conservation approach of preserving some kind of a process, maybe the process of diversification. I've got some pollinator pictures here. We set up some arrays just to see if the bees cared about the different colors and the take-home lesson is probably not uh it's um we use digital camcorders we were out here off of malik road if you're familiar with the area it's between metcalf and the dump uh, and uh, you'll see um, santa Teresa hills in the distance there and the santa cruz mountains and loma prieta behind them uh, in the, the picture on the left you can see all the different camcorders we had up about eight of them with these little arrays with a um, set up where there was either a white or pink in the center, and then we had every other one around the outside. These hexagonal arrays are pretty well established in pollinator studies to have equidistant uh, likelihood of going to any other plant from landing on one of them. And we can count the number of visits by bumblebees, honeybees, and flies, and you'll see, like I mentioned earlier from a question from the audience, that bumblebees are the most common pollinators by far, and that's almost all bobmas, Vos and Secchia. They tend to go to both species and there was no significant difference in the visits to um, the pinker ones versus the whiter ones. Um, the number of new visits to a, a, an array when a pollinator approaches the array, what do they stop at first? Uh, they stopped at white around 21 or 22 times and pink about 25 times, not significantly different. Now, once they're in the array, we can ask uh, how many transitions did they make? White to pink? Well, uh, they made six white to pinks uh, and then six white to whites. So if they started on white, they went the same, they were more, they were equally likely to go to pink as they were to go to white. Alternatively, if they landed on pink, they were more likely to switch to white, but if they landed on pink, they stayed on pink uh, only very few of the times. We didn't have a ton of visits. So not a, when you start dividing up the data, we don't have as many um, pollinators that moved within the array. Um, but I don't think that these are gonna be really strongly significant. So the take home lesson is it doesn't seem like the pollinators have a really drastic preference for the colors. There may be some subtle differences, but um, nothing really dramatic. And finally, a question that always emerges is, well, if you're really relying all this on the flower color, there's very few other reliable traits and we've looked so hard for something vegetative, something about the leaves or the stems. And there's some suggestions that the hairs at the base of the stem might matter but that doesn't seem very consistent when we grow them in common garden. Is the color really that reliable? Because we know that we can change the colors of things like hydrangeas by simply putting a, a zinc ring around the base of it and changing the chemistry of the soil. And unfortunately, that example from hydrangea is really unusual. And that's why hydrangeas are so cool, is that not very many plants can change their flower color by their environment. We can change the color of leaves quite readily. We can change the color of, um, stems and you can even change the color of roots by shining different lights on them but changing the color of a flower is usually a pretty substantial change and requires a genetic mutation so we grew them in common garden see the colors stay the same and then um, we've now looked at their all the genes expressed in those or turned on in those sepals and i don't want to go through too much of the details just to show you that um, when we looked at all the genes turned on in these sepals, we found a lot of genes to start with on the order of 20 to 30,000 genes. Um, we found one gene in particular 
that had a huge amount of expression higher in the lights than the whites. That is a light pink flower compared to a white flower. It had 77 more times of this 5GT. This is a stabilizing gene that helps the flower keep its color. We also found 50 times more expression of one of the anthocyanin biosynthetic genes. This is the gene, one of six genes it takes to make anthocyanins. This is another gene it takes to make it, 50 times more in the lights. These are all what you'd expect from a difference between a paramoinus flower and a metcalf flower. And the most exciting part is this MIB L2 because the MIB is like the master control light switch. And it says the pathway is on, go ahead and make color. And then it starts this cascade to make the color pathway genes or off and therefore your flower will be white. And that was only 17 times, but significantly more common in light than white. TTG2 is another one of these master switches. Um, and luckily we can leverage pretty in-depth studies of a model plant, a little mustard called Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, which has proven that this MIB is a regulator of flavonoid biosynthesis. So that means anthocyanins. Oh, all sorts of genes I could talk to you about, but I'd rather talk about flower color and pollinators if anybody has any questions. Um, occasionally we do see a pink one appear in the Metcalf population, which is a mystery to us. Are those new mutations or old mutations? Here's our team of uh, Santa Clara graduate, Aaron Tom and myself and some Creekside scientists like Stu Weiss and Crystal and Jimmy who planted all the seeds out at Tulare Hill and I've been working on them now with these color questions. And here's my kiddos from the Antelope Valley Poppy Preserve. And hey, look, we found the, one of the few white ones out there. With that, uh, if there's any time and anybody's still in the room, I'm glad to answer any questions. I think we have about 60 or 70 still here between Zoom and YouTube. So, wow. Um, so, we've got a couple questions. We're, we're here for this. So, first of all, uh, someone said they found a population of Striptanthus albidus albidus in Marin County on serpentine soils somewhere about Mount Tam, but that was, and how did it get there? But then we had an answer from someone saying that is Striptanthus glandulosus secundus. So right. you took care of that question. <laughs> yeah, if somebody wants to, uh, to pass me the locality data, I'm glad to look at a picture. I love getting pictures of flowers in my email. Uh, I can... Maybe we can put my email up on the um, website or something if somebody wants to. You can find me pretty easily at Santa Clara University. Go ahead, Judy. Sure. If one of my co-hosts has an email, um, your Santa Clara address in our email, maybe we could put it in the chat. So, okay. Um, then we had a question with with the spec spectrophotometer. Do you think for these comparisons, the whole spectrum has significant value or would the comparisons just around the anthocyanin absorption maximum be enough? Yeah, uh, yeah, somebody's done a lot of homework because uh, these are complicated things. The spectra that goes, I can show you really quick if you want to see. Um, we developed something called an M value and it's only called M because it looks like an M. Do you see the pink one kind of goes up and then down and then up and then eventually it drops back down but I cut those off because we don't see that, that's in the infrared. Um, the degree of dipping here, that's the lowest point, compared to the average of these two high shoulders over here is what we defined as the M value. It's now used pretty widely in flower colors that involve anthocyanins. Um, and that seems to be the most consistent value that we are using. But um, you can divide up the categories, the wavelengths into categories, and that's how you measure chroma. Or you can measure the area under the curve, if you're familiar with that dare I say calculus at this hour on a Tuesday night, uh, Thursday <laughs> night. But um, you can measure the area under the curve and that's the brightness, that's the overall amount of intensity. Like for example, you can see this dark purple one has a much lower brightness. Um, but what we're really after is this um, amount of a pull down at 550, which is the, the M value. Great question. Great, um, yes. So uh, let's see. Pollinators can see UV. Could that be the reason they don't have a flower preference here? Right, yeah, excellent. Oh my gosh, uh, that's why I love talking to the Native Plant Society because I've, I've told some of this story to a diversity group as Judy knows and, um, and I get uh, great questions from different angles that I don't hear from academia and, and they're so refreshing because nobody's ever asked about that, which is maybe the pollinators don't know the difference because they are seeing down here in the 350 to 400 better than we are. 
The only thing that we have to be careful about, it's not that, the, that we see here and then pollinators only see here. It's that we see here and pollinators, particularly um, bumblebees, they have shifted. So they gain about 50 nanometers to 350, but they've lost the red. This is important for like the evolution of hummingbird pollinated flowers because the red flower is actually to prevent the bees from visiting the flower. They can't see those flowers in contrast to the green background. But back to jewel flowers, um, they're still seeing the majority of those wavelengths out to 650, but they aren't seeing between 650 and 700. Um, but you're right, they are tuned to those wavelengths and they are not significantly different. So that provides a really great um, spectrophotometer mechanism for why the pollinators don't see it as different as we do. I right. didn't include this color hexagon, but you can actually take these spectra and you can feed them through a model and it tells you uh, how the bees visualize this because their perception is also different. Um, and the bees perception puts it in the same category of this B hexagon, suggesting that they don't discriminate it. Um, great insight, thank you for that. Um, great, uh, so in addition to spectral perceptions, e.g. UV attractivity, there's smell, electrical, prior immediate history of visitations, et cetera. I don't know if that's a comment or a question. Right, is that how it ends, Judy? Yes, Perfect. et cetera. Yeah. What they're trying to point out is that uh, the pollinators don't just respond to, to color. Um, we have not uh, measured the volatiles. So for example, scent, you can collect that on a piece of filter paper by flowing air over the flower and collect it on a filter paper. And then you can do some biochemistry on that. And there's some great labs that do that. And I have not done that. Uh, we don't detect a difference from our sensory systems on the scent, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, there's also often reward differences like in the nectar. Um, and these guys are making on the order of like less than a microliter. That's one one thousandth of a milliliter and a milliliter just barely fills a couple drops out of an eyedropper. Um, so collecting nectar is um, not something that I'm capable of doing very reliably. So it's so small that I don't think it's going to be dramatically different. Um, but I'm always keen on trying to detect any other floral differences that might the pollinators might be um, using because that's a passion of mine to try to think like plants and then to try to think like pollinators who think like plants. We should spend more time doing that, I think. Yeah. Um, is there a significant energy course associated with creating flavonoids? Oh, you just God. say when you, you've had enough because we got a couple more coming in. No, I mean, people can check out when they want. You caught me talking about some things that are close to my heart. Um, if it costs energy, then maybe some of these plants would have higher fitness if they didn't make the pigments. You'd expect the white ones, for example, um, to be saving a bunch of energy. It turns out the flavonoids are some of the least expensive secondary metabolites. So in contrast, making chlorophyll, which is very nitrogen rich, even takes some iron, which is often rare in the soils, um, and takes a lot of a, different proteins and amino acids to make chlorophyll. So plants will actually actively disassemble their chloroplasts and sort all those um, atoms back to different parts of the um, plant. On the other hand, you know what happens in the fall, particularly on the East Coast, is the plants not only remove their chlorophyll, but the anthocyanins are there. And it turns out the, those plants are actually like maples and whatnot on the East Coast. They're making more anthocyanins. That's because they no longer have the chlorophyll to collect the sunlight and those, um, they're concerned about gaining mutations. So plants will make uh, anthocyanins inexpensively to protect themselves against stress um, in contrast to, for example, the cost of a chlorophyll. That's not to say that it doesn't have a cost, but it's mostly carbon and very few plants in this kind of habitat are carbon limited. Okay, uh, so do you think glandulosis, glandulosis is an ancestral state or a hodgepodge of convergent forms? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I assume they're talking mostly about the color, but they could also be referring to the habitat. And I'd be glad to hear from the person who wrote the question if they're at, Okay. Uh, yeah, Zoom. I put the, the, I've given, provided your email on both. Perfect. Both um, I mean, I can speak to it very briefly, which one thing is, is that glandulosis, glandulosis comes in um, purple and I have rarely, if ever, seen anything other than what seems to me to be the same shade of dark purple. Um, 
it's it does come on and off serpentine which suggests that that might be the ancestral state and then that's called a tolerator when it can be on and off and then the tolerator tends to evolve into the serpentine endemic which is like albatus albatus and paramoinus and those ones are the ones that can't go back very easily if not ever to being off serpentine because they've lost the competitive abilities now what is the one species that you see sometimes in co park on serpentine that's almost black extremely dark Excellent, excellent. I, I took that out of this figure, but it's supposed to be down there and it's a it's a curve here at the very bottom because we included it. It's not only at Co, but it's also up at the top of Mount Hamilton. Um, at the moment, that's an undescribed uh, species of glandulosis. Uh, what happens is if you make pink, that's a little bit of pigment. White is no pigment. Pink is a little bit of pigment. Medium amount of pigment is purple like you see here in glandulosis and if you just keep making more and more and more pigment it eventually turns the sepals nearly black if you look really carefully under microscope you'll see that it's actually a purple pigment and it's the amount of it in the vacuole so uh, that remains I'm pretty sure an undescribed species and if you care Judy since you mentioned it if you see over That's here my question, actually. <laughs> yeah if you see over here TOR and OBS, those mm -hmm. are the two populations. One's called Observatory Peak and the other one's called Tortilla Flats. Those are two populations up near Mount Hamilton um, that are really strongly supported. The bootstrap is 98, that is a level of support. So we're really confident that that is a distinct lineage separate from these other. For all intents and purposes, I grouped it with glandulosis, but glandulosis really should be divided into um, two groups based on my sampling. Great. Uh, and then there was another note about Mount Tam that there is one yellow sepal population of glandulosis there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear from that person if they want to send me pictures or if they have an iNaturalist um, observation or an herbarium collection. Great. Uh, okay, I thought we were done. One more has come in. On top of color, do you see any variability in flower size that seems to enact any significant pollinator responses or influence fruit production? Yeah, the flowers, if they differ in size, it's going to be on a scale that I don't feel comfortable making a call on because the sepals we're talking about, they're less than a centimeter. So they're on the order of about five to eight millimeters. And if you really stress the plant out, you can get it to make slightly smaller flowers, uh, probably by 20 to 30 percent smaller. And if you give it a lot of nutrients, I think it maxes out at less than a centimeter. For example, in the greenhouse, when we had to bulk the pop seeds for the captive breeding population, they were given fertilizer and water ad nauseum. Those plants uh, were really robust, but the flowers stayed the same. The leaves get bigger. Um, they get really sensitive to drought because if you stop watering them, they've got so many stomata and they have such bad water um, holding capacity that they dry up really fast. So you just have to water them every day, but the flower doesn't tend to change size. So it may be something subtle that I'm missing, but I'm going to suggest that the size um, is pretty pretty constitutive. That is, it's it's stuck, just like the color seems to be pretty stuck. And this is pretty true of a lot of angiosperm flowers. The leaves are variable, the stems are variable, the roots are variable. These are all responding to the environment. And when it comes time to reproduce, you turn on some kind of blueprint that is constitutive. That you're going to have this color flower, and you're going to have this size sepals, etc. I think that's it. I think we should probably pause. It's we've been going for a long time here, and I'm sure it's getting dark where you are. This happened to us last time too. Um, did you want to mention anything about um, a cow bot or um, uh, anything else about students or anything like that, real quick? Sure. I wanted to make sure that I, I appreciate the Native Plant Society so much, and would do anything I could if you guys ever need help. And uh, I, as a California Botanical Society board member and the editor at Madronio, I wanna make sure your membership is aware that that journal is not just for academics. We love to publish noteworthy collections in particular. And I know some of your membership just from the questions that they've asked in this seminar um, may have noteworthy collections that should be published in there. So have a look at the journal, recognize that students can get one year free subscription um, to the journal and to the society. So that's one thing that we're offering now. We also have great offer to publish in color and open access options. And uh, I think that a lot of um, our noteworthy collections are now coming from people who are out there looking at plants and identifying them, not so much professors, but and academics or even uh, agency people, but just uh, people who really love plants. And I think you guys 
um, are a great resource for that. So please keep that in mind. I also wanted to mention that we support the local science fairs, the synopsis science fairs for the Silicon Valley and Santa Clara County. Um, so if there's any people out there, any kids out there in high school, junior high, high school, or any parents of junior high and high schoolers, um, we give uh, cash awards for the best plant projects and we love native plant projects. That's great. Um, I think that's all we got. We often, uh, we often um, press our speakers to promise a future field trip if we ever can, some, maybe some little visitation of some of these populations in the future. So yeah. hopefully one day we'll be able to do that. Yeah, Madeline, do you have something? Yeah. You have to let me unmute my co host here. I just want to say that as someone who is less botanically knowledgeable, I have learned so much from this talk. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Um, all right. Uh, are you still there, Justin? Justin went on mute. All right. I'm here. Okay, great. So I think, uh, oh, he's unsharing his screen. So thanks very much. Uh, Vivian, do you want to wrap it up? Uh, yeah, thanks, Justin. Yeah, that was amazing. And like that, Madeline, I learned a lot too. So I'm, and like Judy, I also want a field trip someday if that's possible. <laughs> uh, so thanks everybody for joining. Thanks for sticking with us. It's been, uh, that we're, we're getting into the dark now. And um, just remember, we have a lot of great programs coming up. You can find us on Meetup, you can find us on Facebook, and you can find us on our website. All of our upcoming programs are gonna be listed. So thank you very much and hope to see you guys at our, our next event. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.